what does a pharmacist do? Well, most people might answer that a pharmacist dispenses the medications that my doctor prescribes. Now, I work with a ton of great pharmacists, and one thing that I don't generally see is excitement about pills in a vial. And this is probably because pharmacists have been trained to do so much more. So what can you get excited about in your community? To find out, let's go beyond the scripts. Hey, welcome back to Beyond the Scripts. I'm your host, Will Tuft with Pioneer Rx, and today we're broadcasting from the new Shreveport uh, studio area. So pretty excited about that. Also super excited to welcome for the first time on this podcast, uh, Joe McCamey, who is a pharmacist in Tennessee, who has really taken his role as a pharmacy manager at Markram's Pharmacy to a new level with patient communications and really community engagement and just uh, really meeting the needs of a small community uh, in a really big way. So Joe, thanks for joining us. Uh, excited to finally have you on here. Absolutely. I know it's uh, it's been a long time coming. We've tried to work it out several times, and it's just not it's not worked out. I'm uh, I'm kind of honored to put on these headphones as I as I unpacked it from the <laughs> um, when I unpacked it from the little suitcase that it comes in. I was like, man, there's some really uh, there's some really cool people that have put these headphones on, and I get to be like in the line of that. And so that's uh, it was actually really kind of a little humbling to go, wow, this is. Uh, <laughs> there have been some, they're pretty, some, some pretty smart dudes put these headphones on. So, and dudettes. So, don't want to forget the dudettes. Yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah. So, a little, a little behind the scenes for um, anybody watching out there. Podcasts take a, a little bit of technology, and sometimes there's that, that barrier of you know what technology you have. I don't have a camera. I don't have this and that. So we we have these great. Um, uh, cases that, you know, our IT team, and, and it's really kind of approached like we do everything else with Pioneer RX is, you know, how do, how do we uh, identify this goal and then make it really super uh, easy to, you know, implement, duplicate, and 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 reliably have that same kind of uh, experience. So uh, it, it is kind of a great, like, small, like, super narrow focused uh, view of just the way we do things. So <laughs> glad to hear it's working. It, it was cool. You know, when I opened it up, I was like, oh, man, this is neat. Hey, just just to make one little correction, just a reminder, I'm not actually a pharmacist, so I don't want to rep- misrepresent myself. I actually had kind of an interesting journey to uh, get into the world of independent pharmacy. So, you know, that's been uh, kind of interesting. Awesome. Thank you for pointing that out because that is an interesting part of your role. Most of the people that we talk to here are uh, pharmacists and pharmacy owners. You've taken a different path and found a way to really fill a need um, within the leadership team, although not going through the channels of ownership. And to me, um, ownership sounds like a very um, daunting experience, you know, the, the idea of building a team that can help you succeed and being part of a team that is super successful and, and kind of focusing on what you do well and, and, and not having all of that weight on your own shoulders sounds really, really appealing to me personally. (laughs) Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, and I always say when I think about where I'm at now that, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't take for granted the work that was done to whether it be an independent pharmacy as a whole or even here locally in, in our community, the work that was done to build a business that I could come in and be a part of initially and uh, be a part of that team and uh, hopefully, you know, continue to help grow and uh, leave the legacy of what this place means to this community. And then uh, just thinking about the future, uh, how we can take what this place means to this community and make sure that other communities continue to have the same kind of service provided to them. So uh, that's kind of where my mind is uh, headed right now is, you know, how how can we make sure uh, that we uh, save and revitalize independent pharmacy in other communities as well and it, it takes somebody coming in and making sure that that, uh, that that business is functioning properly, that it has a 
a vision for the future and it is keeping up with uh, the times and, and that kind of thing, which is why I was brought in here is, you know, our owner, uh, Ray Markram, you know, has always been on the cutting edge of technology. And when he realized, you know, 16 years ago that, you know, maybe maybe we aren't where we need to be and, and maybe I'm no longer the guy to get us there. So like that, that that was huge to me to see somebody willing to say that, like, hey, maybe I'm not the person to get us to that point and we need to have somebody that can. Uh, so that's that's kind of the that end of the story as to how I ended up here. Yeah, which is, you know, a really challenging part of leadership, I think, is is that delegation and and that trust of of being able to grow a team that you can rely on. Um, I think that's one of the the challenges that I saw over and over and over when I was spending week after week in pharmacies was when you have uh, an independent pharmacist who's also the business owner, um, you know, there's just so much uh, that, that has to be done from, you know, you're the building manager, you're the security expert, you're the, the customer service um, uh, end all and be all and the ordering guru. I mean, you're, you're really wearing so many hats. Um, and so that delegation seems like such a, such a, a crucial piece of, of success there. So tell me a little bit about the pharmacy where um, you started, I guess, what, 16 years ago? Yeah, yeah. So the the pharmacy itself has been here since 1978. So it's been around a couple of years. And uh, we live in, it's in Manchester, Tennessee, uh, probably uh, most famously known at this point for the music festival Bonnaroo. So yep. uh, here we've got a little town of, you know, 10, 12,000 people. And once a year, anywhere from 80 to 120,000 people descend on our little town, on a little farm right off the interstate uh, to enjoy some music and uh, other uh, activities as well. I think uh, that they enjoy <laughs> while, while, they're on the, while they're on the farm. So uh, I guess what happens at the farm stays at the farm and uh, we'll leave it at that, right? So, <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I was really surprised, um, you know, because I, I've known you for a uh, handful of years and, and I've, I've known of the pharmacy, but I didn't really know the community. And I, I, I um, spent a bit of time on Google and I was like, oh, no way. That's where Bonnaroo is at. And I, I was really surprised that your city population, like it, it's a really small community. Uh, and within that community, you have like six other pharmacies in town. Um, so really kind of an interesting, um, like customer base, I guess that you would, that you would have, um, in that area. I, I guess you serve a lot of outlying smaller rural areas as well. We do, we do, but I will say that through community engagement and community involvement, whether it's myself or our other pharmacist or, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Ray over the years, uh, just that community involvement has been huge in that people want to come here because they know that we uh, want to serve the community in a bigger way, not just with their with their health care needs. So that, that's that been a huge part of of our overall success, for sure. Yeah, I um, also happen to notice that Bonnaroo is the same weekend as Pioneer RX Connect. So <laughs> if you uh, if you do come out to Nashville for Connect, maybe you can uh, make a drive <laughs> and go catch a little bit of the uh, the Bonnaroo festivities. So <laughs> there you go. At the very least, when you're especially if you fly in, you're probably going to be on the plane with some interesting characters uh, at times. Although most of them drive in because you know it's a uh, you know they're camping and uh, you know they're you know doing their thing. So. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's always an interesting, it's always an interesting weekend. That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, 16 years ago, uh, you, you ended up joining this team. Now, did they just bump into you at Bonnaroo and say, <laughs> Hey, uh, Hey Joe, drop the, drop the bongo drum and come on over. <laughs> right. <laughs> how, how did you know? Right. How did you know? <laughs> that's, the, that's the way it works. Anyway, no. <laughs> So, uh, full disclosure, uh, so I moved to Manchester. Uh, so I started here in 2005. I moved to Manchester in 1999. 
and I actually moved uh, to work for a church. I was the the youth minister at a local church here and did that uh, for four years. And uh, while the, the ministry went really well, I realized it wasn't my long-term uh, life calling. So uh, I, I played around in the insurance world for a little bit uh, and then uh, insurance and investments and uh, realized that wasn't exactly where I wanted to be. And then um, I spent some time in the corporate world with, uh, with Verizon Wireless and then with U.S. Bank. And then my, so full disclosure, my father-in-law uh, owned the pharmacy and uh, he came to me and said, hey, my business manager uh, just gave me a, a year and a half notice. <laughs> so uh, that, that's kind of where we're at. Now, back that up a little bit, just to, to thinking, of, thinking about pharmacy, uh, he hired the business manager um, five or six years before that, sometime around the year 2000, uh, when he had a consultant come in and just had this consultant really analyze the whole business. And I think that's super important to have those outside perspectives at times come in and look and see what you're doing because they're going to see things that you don't see. So they said, hey, listen, you've got to have somebody at the, at the size you are now, to your point earlier, Will, uh, at the size you are now, you can't handle all the little things and be a pharmacist uh, and have time to do the other things that you're passionate about. So he said, you know, you, you've got to get somebody that is a business manager at the size you are because, you know, a, a lot of pharmacies will just hire another pharmacist, right? Well, it, it's that whole uh, axiom that, you know, the, the work will always expand or contract to the amount of time that you have to do it. So a lot of times you add another pharmacist and uh, the pharmacist duties, uh, whether it be checking scripts or doing MTMs or counseling, you know, it just kind of expands. And all of a sudden you've got another pharmacist, but you're not turning out any more work. Right. And so at that point, he said, look, what you've got to do is you've got to hire somebody that specifically focuses on the business and focuses on those things so that you don't get uh, staff bloat, basically. And so that, that's why it was key to have somebody focused on those things. So the, he gave, you know, a year and a half notice. He said, you know, I'm retiring. Uh, you know, I, I just, it's time for me to, to kind of move on. And so my father-in-law approached me and said, hey, you've had some great experience over these past several years, whether it be with people at the church or, uh, you know, your, your corporate experience or even the, the financial side of things. He said, why don't you come and take this next year and a half to do two things, uh, learn the pharmacy business and uh, get us up to speed on our technology. And so, uh, you know, we, we talked about it, we prayed about it and we're like, you know what, let's, uh, let's give it a go. So, uh, we, and he was really excited to have us as family back in the business. And I won't say that it's always been, uh, easy on the family, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, we, we've had those moments where, uh, family dinners have been, uh, stressful at times. Um, in the midst of all that, we also uh, helped plant a church together uh, as the as uh, us, his family, and then two other families. And you know, so now we're mixing um, work, family, religion, and uh, of course, politics always gets in there sometimes too. So the, it, it made for some um, interesting and stressful times as as we worked through it all. But uh, he has a lot of grace. I've learned a lot of grace uh, over the years, and uh, we we figured out a way to to work it out and and make it work. So uh, it, it's been a good journey. Yeah. So you guys took like the list of topics that you don't talk about <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and so, like and, and mashed them into the family right. uh, the to to the dinner table. So. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's a big part of this too. Is you know, um, anytime you have a family-owned business, anytime you have a an owner pharmacist, um, you know, a it's it's going to take that support of your family to be that invested in your profession. Like I don't see how you can do that um, and and have it completely separated. You there's just no way you can hang up the uh, 
the the pharmacist uniform, the 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 entrepreneur uniform on the on the hook when you walk out. Um, but I mean, B, that's got to be really kind of the um, there. There's that romantic notion that you know that's it's such a cool thing to be able to do, even if it doesn't always um, you know just just have the uh, the rosy uh, uh, kind of romantic ideology behind it. So, right, right. So now, now it's kind of full circle. My son is working. He's, he's almost 17. He's working in the pharmacy part time. So, uh, that's been, that's been fun too, uh, to have him around. And I don't know if either of my boys will uh, come back and, and be a part of this when, when, you know, they decide what they want to do with their careers. But, um, it, it, it has been, it's been fun. So I, I try to pretend like, I don't know if you watch the TV show Blue Bloods or not. Um, no. Oh no, you, you got to watch it. You know Tom Selleck, and you know he's the the <laughs> he's the commissioner of police, and you know he's got two or three sons that are are policemen or detectives, and then his daughter is the assistant DA, and so it's all in the family. But there's always a scene in every episode where they're around the dinner table, and uh, sometimes it gets heated, sometimes it gets stressful, but uh, they they work through all their all their stuff together and. Uh, so I just try to pretend like, you know, we're the blue bloods of, um, you know, a, a, a pharmacy. <laughs> right. So and, and, and not the Yellowstone. <laughs> That's much different dinner table. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you should check out Blue Bloods. It's a it's a good it's a good show. So uh, right on. So are, are the boys like interested in pharmacy? And even more interestingly, I, I, I always like to hear the um, kind of the inside view because there's there's definitely two schools of thought. There are the um, the the red ocean uh, pharmacy professionals that say, "Oh man, you know we're getting edged out, and it's and it's just you know low margins, low reimbursements." I wouldn't go to pharmacy school. And then every now and then you talk to a pharmacist like uh, Ahuna Freeman who says, you know. Uh, if pharmacy is is my stage. That's where I can go and practice my art. And there's infinite ways to to, to express that art. And and so there's really a huge span in the way people see the future of pharmacy and the opportunity. Yeah, it, it is interesting. So my oldest son right now uh, does see himself in healthcare at some point. Uh, right now, as most teenage boys do, uh, you know, he's talking about wanting to. Uh, teenage boys that are interested in healthcare uh, always always want to be orthopedic surgeons so they can work with the athletes, right? Um, <laughs> that's just that's just what they do. Uh, so we'll see where that ends up uh, in terms of what what he wants to do. But as far as the the future of pharmacy, I, I think I think what you're describing are, are two different uh, two different roles that that I've observed in pharmacy. And as pharmacy owners, we've got to decide. Uh, which one we're going to be. I, I'm unique in the fact that the decision is made for me because I'm not a pharmacist, right? Uh, but pharmacy owners that are pharmacists have to make a decision. And that decision is, uh, did I open my own business because I wanted to have a business and be an entrepreneur? Or did I open my own business uh, because I just wanted to be a pharmacist? And that one that opened their own business just because they wanted to be a pharmacist, they're going to struggle. Right. Because uh, their their focus is being a pharmacist. Uh, then there's the folks that have said, I'm opening a business. I just happen to be a pharmacist. So that's 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 how I'm going to to run my business. Uh, here's the thing. Business changes all the time. OK. And so uh, it's not going to be practiced like it was 25 years ago. Twenty five years from now, it's not going to be practiced like it was today. And so when you're a business owner, you have to be willing and ready all the time to to shift, to pivot, to uh, to change focus, to say, OK, th this is what works now. This is what used to work uh, and, and to be open to those things. So, I, you know, w whenever I'm talking about this with other pharmacy owners and and they're complaining about uh, about these things, I'm like, well, th think about uh, think about Netflix. Right. Uh, a, a lot of. Like my kids don't even realize they were a DVD company, right? Yeah. They were they were a DVD through the mail. Like 
the the most inefficient, but but they were they were profitable, right? And and they were doing okay with their DVD business. And then streaming came along. Well, if they had said, no, we're focused on our physical product and it, it's going to always be the the DVD. Guess what? Netflix would be out of business. Uh, but right now, you know, they're they're making billion. You know, they've got billions of dollars in revenue every year because they were willing to change as time went on. They didn't say we're in the DVD business. They said we're in the entertainment business. And so for us, we're not in the pill business. We're in the pharmacy business. And those are two very different things. Uh, So as long as pharmacies keep focusing on, hey, we're in the pill business. Yeah, that that is the red ocean. That is the shark infested area. Uh, if, if we focus on the fact, Hey, we're in the healthcare business that changes the, that changes the game. Uh, and, and pharmacists, and that's the funny thing about this to me from, this is from an outside perspective, right? Not being a pharmacist. It's so funny to me that pharmacists, pharmacists didn't get into the business to hand out pills. You go talk, right. you, you go ask any pharmacist, did you get into pharmacy to be able to hand people pills? No. Why did you get into pharmacy? Because I want to be uh, an integral part and and a, an approachable, uh, you know, relatable part of their healthcare journey. Okay, let's go be that. Let's go do that. But yet we get so focused and myopic on what do they reimburse me for these pills? So that that's yeah. that's kind of my perspective. Um, getting to look at it from a, a non-pharmacist. Uh, perspective that might make some people mad they you know i don't know i mean i I think you're right on now i mean if you're at the verification station and you're you're reviewing reimbursements one after another as they come through i mean that's got to weigh really heavy um but you're right there there are such uh i mean infinite possibilities uh and responsibilities outside of of that role in itself and so another thing that really surprised me about um Mark Rooms Pharmacy is, uh, besides the small size of the community, uh, you have a very large team at that pharmacy. Um, so I thought that was really cool. When you go to the website, there's you know a photo of the entire team. So how many people are on your team and how does that, um, that large of an army help you meet the, the goals of that pharmacy? Yeah, so we're between 30 and 35 employees at any given time. And don't get me wrong, we definitely uh, had uh, some of our staff focus and uh, uh, fall into this whole uh, great resignation of the end of 2021. So we had more turnover in 2021 than we've ever had in, in, prop, in, in really all 40 plus years that we've been in business. Um, but in the 16 years that I've been here, definitely the highest turnover, um, in 2021. And everybody knows about all the factors, whether it's COVID fatigue or, you know, the, the job market is more competitive for pay. Uh, we had, you know, people having kids. I mean, there was just lots of, lots of reasons. Uh, and so we've definitely had our fair share of turnover this past year, but, um, no, I, I think, you know, our, our, how does how does that big of a team help? Well, uh, it, it it is uh, the the people that that end up here definitely want to serve, and as long as we have people that are wanting to serve, you know they're coming to me every day with, hey, can can we do this this way? Can have you have we thought about doing it this way? So like they're engaged, and having all those minds uh, is is super important. Uh, to me to have just these these varying opinions. And I will say that through this great resignation of 2021 is that something that I've learned is, um, y- you know, the old joke about the guy that uh, when he first gets married or meets his wife or whatever, he's, you know, he says, honey, I love you. And if it changes, I'll tell you. Right. So right. I, I, I've got to confess that sometimes I've treated my staff that way in the past. Like, hey, you're doing a great job. I give you your paycheck every two weeks. Your paycheck is your, hey, you did your job these two weeks. And, um, you know, once I told you that I like you and that I want you here and I'm not firing you, that means I still like you, right? <laughs> and, 
And so maybe maybe over the years I've fallen into that trap. And so uh, what happened is in the early fall, uh, our kind of my floor level manager was one of the the folks that that we lost. She was she'd been with us nine years, and uh, she she got an opportunity she couldn't pass up, and you know she left with our blessing. And uh, so I've I've had I, I've not had to. Uh, at first, it felt like I had to, but I've had the opportunity over these past four or five months to uh, really re-engage on a personal level with our team. And our productivity is significantly different. Our, I think our morale is significantly different. Uh, and so it just reminded me to uh, to really re-engage with our people and that, yeah. that our people are the most important thing. So uh, if, if our people are happy, our patients are happy. If our staff is happy, our, our patients are happy. And so, um, and I still do have this, uh, this management, uh, theory or, 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 or perspective of a three-legged stool, right? So you've got the business, you've got your, and these are in no particular order. You've got the business, you've got your patients and you've got your staff. And if all three are treated somewhat equally and given, uh, and and, uh, and all three are considered in every decision, the stool stands. But if one, like if you start to, uh, you know, lean too much toward the patient, you know, maybe the, you, you know, you cut prices or uh, you, uh, you staff up too much, you have too many employees. And so that hurts the business. And uh, so, or you don't, you don't back your staff. Like when a patient complains, and right. uh, and you don't have your staff's back. All of a sudden, you have morale issues, and so that that leg of the stool gets too big or too long, and it causes the whole stool to fall over. So uh, I really try to approach all of our decisions from the thirty thousand foot view, anyway, as how's this going to affect all three, um, and if if one's out of balance, how do we correct that and make it back into balance? And so. These past few months have really taught me that to go, you know, I, I've really got to uh, I've always cared about our staff. I've always cared about our people. But I can't just tell them that once and expect it to be OK. Right. Yeah. Um, so and, and I hesitate to say this, but especially in an environment where um, and I think a lot of pharmacies are this way, an environment where. Uh, a lot of the staff is, are, are ladies, and uh, I don't know if you know this, Will, but they think differently than we do. I've heard this. Um, I've, I've never, never experienced, experienced it myself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play it real safe on this one. <laughs> so, but, but I have to change, you know, if I'm going to lead, the, you know, you ask about the team, that's how we drive into this. But if I'm going to lead the team well, I have to keep that top of mind. And and maybe I've been uh, guilty of not doing that at times. And so I think that's huge for uh, for folks to to take, you know, a self-evaluation and go, am I really engaging my staff the way that I should? Yeah, that that's one of the really interesting like unintended consequences i guess of the the whole pandemic or the the ripple side effect that maybe you wouldn't have predicted but um you know the mental health aspect of you know the general just population is you know really kind of been pushed in a in a, in a new focus because you know people were lonely people were um isolated people have kind of needed those connections uh, and needed um, something more than, you know, uh, maybe, you know, what, what, what they've been getting previously, you know, when, when you, when you have time to just um, be alone and, and be isolated and, and, and you need those, those things. It's like a plant, uh, you know, not, not being near a window, <laughs> you know, that plant needs sunlight. And I, I think people have um, maybe, kind of shifted focus a little bit. You know, if you look at the like hyper fixation on business and success that you saw like in the eighties and, and, in the nineties with, you know, the over the top status symbols and, you know, um, the, the, the wall street, uh, kind of movie genre, you know, 
it's kind of an antiquated, uh, I don't know, ideology uh, for most Americans, I think now. But but it also kind of made, like you said, uh, businesses kind of reflect and say, you know, yeah, we let's let's make sure we don't take that for granted because it is so important, and 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 we we all kind of got that great reminder. Yeah, yeah, and and so it's also well to b- before I dive into that. The other thing that I've done is, and I don't want this to sound uh, cold, or I don't want it to sound like it's um, uh, inauthentic or unauthentic, whatever, whatever, however you say that word. Uh, but it's to the point with me where, uh, when something is going on with a, one of our staff members, and we've got thirty, so it's not like I'm in constant communication with all of them all the time. Uh, whereas, you know, some pharmacy staffs, uh, you know, you're, you're around you're around those people all day, every day. Uh, you know, we're just that's just not our uh, staff here. Uh, so, you know, I, I'll write things down on my to do list. Right. Um, because I don't want to forget about it. And so some people would say, well, uh, then then isn't your concern just fake or whatever? No, it, it's actually maybe even in my opinion, it may be even more real because. I'm, I'm making sure that I don't miss out on checking on that person. You know, we've had a lot of sickness the first part of this year, uh, whether it be, you know, our staff's kids or, or staff members themselves or that kind of thing. And so I'll just make a note on my daily to do list. I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty uh, rigid about having a to do list every day. And that's one of the things that I, I'll make sure it's on there. Hey, check on so and so their kids sick right now. Right. And, and I just want them to know that I'm thinking about them and I care about them. And, uh, you know, that makes all the difference. Yeah, that that's, I, I think kind of, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of with you on that. I, I think that makes it even more authentic because when you do have time to sit and think to yourself and, you know, when you're drinking your morning coffee, when you're in the shower, when you're mowing the lawn, when your mind is just wondering and you think about those things, uh, that are important, you know, and, and then you, uh, you're intentional about following up with those because, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning, the phone's ringing and there's always something, some distraction pulling you. So making sure that you're intentional about, uh, those, those things that you think about when, when you have time to reflect, I think is super important. Uh, and probably, probably you're right. Something a lot of people don't do and, you know, it's it's funny now. The older I get, the like I, I realize, man, I haven't talked to this person in like twelve months. You know, uh, it's, it's really easy to um, to lose touch or, or to not follow up if you're not intentional. Um, so that, that's a good point. I even have I have recurring reminders on my calendar for you know staff birthdays, staff and like uh, their work anniversary, things like that. And if nothing else, it's a quick text or a quick, you know, conversation that day to go, hey, did you realize you've been here, you know, three years today? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's that's cool. You know, and and just the fact that that I would take the time to bring it up, they, they probably know I've got it on a list somewhere. I mean, they're, they're not dumb. OK, but the <laughs> fact that the fact that I acknowledged it is huge. Right. Uh, the, the other thing I've learned through the the great resignation and I would encourage any pharmacy uh, that that's maybe just getting started maybe you've been in business for a long time uh, or maybe you plan on growing is to have a uh, <laughs> to have kind of your uh, your best practices or your policies and procedures written down the way things you want how you want things done, in a very, um, very deliberate way, right? So, uh, one thing I learned, you know, typically we're hiring a person or two at a time, right? And so they come in and they get, um, they, you know, they, they they really get enveloped by the rest of the staff, and they train them up, and they show them things as they happen, and and it all goes well. Then you have our situation this year where in the span of three months, we lost a manager uh, that would take care of a lot of that and six or seven employees and had to replace those folks all at the same time, right? And so, no, 
we, <laughs> I had people that, that started in August that were training people that started in September. Sure. That, that's, and those people in August were awesome, but that's a recipe for disaster, right? Sure. It's a recipe for things falling through the cracks. It's a recipe for, you know, uh, your, your, uh, patients, you know, missing out on things. It's just, uh, it, it was, it was a tough time through that time where we were at, you know, training new people and that kind of thing. So, uh, one of the things that we started immediately working on was, um, policies and procedures, uh, you know, here's a step-by-step way that we at Markram's pharmacy, um, when, when we replace this NDC with this NDC, this is how we do it, right? Yeah. That this is our step-by-step approach. Um, so anyway, that, that's something that I've learned through this. And so if I would just encourage anybody out there to start doing that, um, it, someday I promise you it's going to be worth the time and it's going to save you a lot of stress on the back end. Yeah, because again, you know, being intentional, having that intentionality to any tasks that are important or anything that are, you know, any any part of the way that you run your business that is fundamentally kind of shaped your culture, there's definitely worth, um, you know, documenting it, looking at it, making sure that that it does align with your uh, your structure at your company. And are we doing this the best way? And then, yeah, let's make sure we continue to, to replicate that. As I've been living in amongst them more as of late because of our assistant manager leaving, uh, like just this week, Will, one thing I noticed and that, that we're changing is uh, in, in Pioneer, all of our data entry technicians, they work out, each of them work out of a different view in the, uh, in the priority field queue. Nice. So, which, which I don't want though, because, okay. right? Because they're all, they're all approaching it differently every day. So right. on, on Monday when, you know, uh, let's just make up names. When, when Susie's, you know, doing data entry, she runs from this view because she just likes the way it, it feels better. And then, uh, you know, th- then on the next day when Johnny is, is doing data entry, cause we, we try to rotate our people so they don't get tired of doing the same thing all the time. Uh, you know, he, he's looking at it a whole different way. And, you know, it, this, this perspective was good because, uh, it, it was more in a, uh, time based, you know, in, in a priority, uh, based view. But th- this person had a different view that, uh, made it easier to do auto processing or, or whatever. So we took some time and we rebuilt those views and we said, okay, when you're doing this job, you use this view. When you're doing this job, when you're doing sync patients, you do this view. When you, you know what I'm saying? So, sure. um, that, that's, that's been, uh, that's been good for us too. Yeah. Cu- customizing those views can be extremely helpful as long as again, um, everyone's on the same page and intentional about, you know, the system that they use, you know, being able to filter, Hey, these are my sync patients, you know, I'm going to sort by health coach. I'm going to break that down and really, you know, have my view, uh, can really, can really help. But yeah, everyone has to be operating on the, the same premise there. So, um, you've, t- you've talked a lot about ways that you communicate with your, with your team, um, communicating within the software, uh, communicating expectations and training. Uh, so that's definitely kind of a recurring theme and, and I can see where that would be so important in independent pharmacy as well as, you know, in ministry, uh, and, and being involved in, in your community in that capacity. Uh, so a lot of the people watching this probably have another, uh, kind of touch point with you. Uh, from your social media presence with the like uh, very active Pioneer RX uh, uh, Facebook group. It's an unofficial group. I'm not even in the group. <laughs> right. Uh, so Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, what... <laughs> Will. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in like all these random Facebook groups about, you know, rock hounding and, uh, you know, 
just all these different like hobby areas, you know, uh, gardening and, and all this, not even in the Pioneer RX Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but again, uh, not, not to be offensive, we would decline you anyway. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't want to be part of any group that would have me. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. so you know, we have been speaking of intentionality. We've been pretty intentional unless one of you has snuck in there. We've, we've tried to keep it users only to keep it where people feel like they can, you know, kind of say whatever they feel like they need to say. And um, some of the things you might want to read and some of the things you might not want to read sometimes. Um, same thing is true about my business, though. You know, there's things that people say about us, you know, on social media that I wouldn't want to read, um, but that I, I know my intention uh, behind what what I'm doing. And so I'm OK with it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. no, I've, I've heard good things. I've heard it's fundamentally, um, you know, positive and, and helpful. But again, you know, that's that kind of fits into, um, you know, that that reoccurring theme of, of community, of helping your peers, whether that's in your community or in your profession uh, and using your voice to, again, just kind of bring people together and, and move the the, the profession or the community or the business, uh, in a positive direction. So, um, kudos. I've, I've only heard good things. So, <laughs> um, so also it, it seems like you've really kind of taken that angle to, um, uh, a, a, as a primary focus, um, for your pharmacy, it seems like your patient communication has always been uh, a real emphasis there. So tell me a little bit about that. Do you have like kind of a a driving factor or did that just happen unintentionally? No. So I, if we take a look at the biggest complaints, I believe, in a busy independent pharmacy, uh, most of the time you hear, again, in a busy independent pharmacy, uh, I, I want my medication faster because sometimes it might take us a minute to to get something ready. Uh, we always want to say, well, it's not like you're ordering French fries, like it's just, but, uh, that that's typically a complaint. And then the other one that we hear is sometimes it's so hard to get through to you guys on the phone. And, and I have to admit that at times that's been the case. And so those are things that we're constantly working on. So, uh, we said, how can, what, what are the ways that we can best, uh, you know, alleviate those issues and technology with the way it's come and the way it's developed. Uh, that was, that was huge for us. So we said, okay, we've got to, and even pre pioneer, uh, we've got to, uh, we've got to have an app that folks can, uh, or a, a web portal or something that folks can do their refill requests on, uh, because they don't want to have to call and wait. They don't want to have to come by the pharmacy, drop their stuff off and leave, uh, and then come back and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and sometimes it is hard to get through to us on the phone. Uh, so we've got to have some type of electronic means uh, by which to do that. Uh, we have never had the touch tone IVR uh, where you can put in prescription numbers. It was just something that uh, we, j we felt like when people called, they want to talk to somebody. And so about the time I was considering that, that's when this whole web portal app world was starting to explode. So I was like, you know, instead of doing the touchstone thing, let's do the app thing, uh, because that same type person probably would go either way on those. And then uh, while that helped some, uh, it, it also, uh, you know, folks can can get notifications like when their medication's ready. So they know not to come until they get this notification that their medication's ready. Uh, so again, that alleviates uh, that problem, you know, calling, are my meds ready yet? Well, <laughs> you know, the, the smart luck side of you wants to go, did you get a notification yet? <laughs> Dude, don't call us. We'll call you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but of course we don't do that. And, and a lot of our folks are kind of trained now uh, to, to wait till they get that notification. And then, uh, then you start seeing that the majority of the world under age 60, they want to text. They, they don't want to talk on the phone. Like personally, if I don't have my AirPods 
to be able to to talk on the phone, I do not want to have a phone conversation. I'm 44, okay, so I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, that young millennial, but I, I mean, I, I'm not a, a boomer either, right? So, uh, but still, I, I'm, I don't want to talk on the phone. And I don't think most people do anymore. So we've got to have, we've got, again, that goes back to the thing we talked about way early in the conversation is, uh, did, did we get into pharmacy because we wanted to hand out pills? Did we get into pharmacy because we wanted to talk on the phone? I mean, you know, we got into pharmacy to serve people where they are. And where people are right now is text messaging, apps, technology, that kind of thing. Um, now, some of our older patients, that may not be them, and that's okay. Uh, interestingly enough, though, we have a lot of 70-year-olds that text us. I'm, sure. I, it, it's, it, it really, it'll, it'll blow your mind. So, um, I, and, and we're answering text messages all day, every day. People love being able to text uh, because, uh, and we're pretty good at responding. Uh, most of the time, our staff is, is pretty on top of those. So that, that's been good. But yeah, it was just to solve that problem of getting their prescriptions out faster. In their mind, the prescription didn't get it didn't go any faster. Will it? It's just that they didn't come till it was ready, right? Sure. So sure. we we fixed the problem in their mind because now oh we're not slow anymore. We're the same speed we always were, <laughs> but now they don't come yeah. till it's ready. Yeah, if you're controlling the conversation, you know, people are only disappointed when their expectations don't match the the experience. So, you know, if I call an Uber and I'm expecting a 30-minute wait, if they show up in 20 minutes, I'm excited, you know, um, and I'm like, great job. Uh, but if I'm expecting a 10-minute wait and they show up in 20 so, uh, you know, my my perception of what happened is very different. So if you can control that and and really communication is just probably the, the single best way to manage expectations, I would think. Sure. So uh, speaking of communications and things like that, just a little thing that we do uh, is when we do take a phone call for prescriptions, the question that we've trained we and we've we might have trained on this as much as we've trained on anything uh to set expectation because expectation is huge, right? Is the question is, so like if you were to call on your prescriptions, Will, I would say, now Will, do you need those medications today or would tomorrow be okay, right? So th there was, there's a lot of psychology that, that, in, that went into that question. One, people are most likely to choose the second option. When you give people two options, they're most likely to choose the second. That's, that's a proven, psychological deal, right? Now, the other thing that I, I created, the first part of that question that I did is, Will, do you need your medication today or would tomorrow be okay? So now at that point, they, it forces them to think, well, I've got three pills. I don't need it today. As opposed to asking, so when are you going to come back? Uh, I'll probably come by this afternoon. Yeah, right. You're not coming until Wednesday or, you know, you're not coming until next week. Right. <laughs> um, right. But, but so, again, we take control of that conversation. And, you know, most a, a good portion of the people say, oh, yeah, tomorrow's fine. So now their expectation is I don't come till tomorrow. And because of that, we're able to, you know, have th more, have things ready more often than not when people show up. Yeah, uh, that that's such a good point. I mean, the the choice of language um, in any conversation, especially with the patient, um, can really kind of direct that conversation. If you ask a patient, "Do you have any questions about these medications?" There's going to be you know some percentage, but it's going to push in the in the no um, category, right? Like you're going to get much more. Uh, negative response to, to that. Whereas if you say, what questions do you have about these prescriptions? Uh, just a couple words can be changed. But if you change those intentionally and if you make that part of your message, uh, your communications will consistently follow a different path. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another little example of that is, you know, we receive, if, if we've got something out of stock, of course, we receive our order typically at 9 or 10 
And for years, when I first got here, and uh, and we finally changed the the culture on this, um, you know, we were out of stock because we were so afraid people were going to be upset. We'd say, now our our order gets here in the you know tomorrow morning, uh, so we'll have you know we'll typically get it by nine or ten. Well, what did the patient hear? They heard I can come get my medication at nine or ten. Well, we've not even right. opened the we've not even opened the tote yet, right? And so we changed that. Again, to your point, to set that expectation, now we say, you know, your medication's out of stock. Uh, we've got it on order. It'll be ready for you by 2 o'clock tomorrow. So now they're not going to come till 2 or after. Now, you know, there's those people that are going to come at 930 anyway um, because that's just what they do. But for the most part, people don't come till after 2 now. And so yeah. and that that also sets a deadline for us to go, okay, we need to have those out of stocks ready by two o'clock. Um, and so that, that puts us on that, that timetable as well. So uh, just again, little tweaks like that uh, can be so huge in your, in your business and your employee satisfaction and your patient satisfaction. And, and you found that with communicating um, with your patients in a variety of mediums, right? You mentioned phone calls, um, text messages, uh, sending SMS directly from the software. Uh, as well as the Arch local app, um, website, uh, refills and requests uh, with the Arch local uh, plug in there. Um, so you've been an early adapter for all of those uh, things and now uh, kind of integrated that into the MedSync process. Um, so again, it, it seems like if you're going to manage expectations, having your patients on sync makes it really easy for your team to also kind of manage what to expect on a, you know, on a daily basis. So um, how, what percentage of your patients would you guess you have on sync currently? So that's an area of growth for us that, that we sure. need to have. So uh, we have about 20 percent, 20, I, I've not looked for January. I think in December it was like 21 percent of our prescriptions filled were through our sync program. And, uh, and, and I hesitate to talk about growing it because the last time, the, the last two times we, where we've said, Hey, it's time to buckle down and, and get it over the point because everybody tells us we're at the, between 20 and 30%, we're at the extreme pain point right now where it, it feels like we're pulling resources here and we're pulling resources there and we're not experiencing all the true benefit from a workflow standpoint. So We've got to push through and get to the next point. So yeah. we were we were at about fifteen percent in February of twenty twenty. Okay, so we've grown it a little bit uh, through the pandemic. You know, everything's been different, uh, and uh, so in February twenty twenty, we 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 took our technicians and we spent an evening together. We role played. Uh, we talked about the uh, the the processes and how things needed to go through the system, and then of course. March 2020 happens and the world changes, right? Sure. So we we just we kind of muddle along and kind of doing our sync thing um, and growing it bits at a time, uh, gaining some patience, losing some patience, that kind of thing. And then um, in July of 2021, we're like, okay, we're kind of through the craziness of the pandemic. Vaccines are slowing down. Testing is slowing down. We did some more training on sync, getting our people back involved. And then Delta hits, <laughs> right? And so all bets are off again. The, the world went to crap again. And, uh, you know, it, here we are. So I'm hesitant to focus on sync again to not cause another pandemic or to not <laughs> – or to, I, I or was, to not – or not to cause another uh, variant to appear. I feel like it's all my fault. I've been wondering who's who to blame, and uh, <laughs> now I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's me. You know, um, so there's just the, – the forces of evil are trying to keep us from growing our sync program. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're definitely um, at, at that spot, though, where you, you have the added, you know, pain point of – a, a process that's being introduced that, you know, you're, you're not fully, um, 
you know, just dedicated to as, as your business model yet. Uh, but you also don't have the efficiency that comes with really moving your workflow to that controlled, um, you know, level of expectation. So it, it's that point in the middle and, and you, that's when you got to push through and, and really then, then you start to see some of those benefits and, and those benefits show up on your shelves too with, um, you know, that just in time ordering and, uh, even, even further managing those patient expectations and, and finding time to do some of the many services you guys offer. Um, so you guys uh, kind of stepped into um, the realm of a lot of point of care testing and not just for COVID, uh, but you guys also are testing A1C and blood pressure and all kinds of fun stuff. So tell me a little bit about that. We're getting close on time, but I uh, definitely want to hear about uh, some of the uh, testing opportunities there. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, our, our staff got really excited about uh, doing the COVID vaccines because we had several big believers. And so uh, we had technicians that got certified to do that. And uh, so I, we've probably done and I know for some people it's not a lot, but for some people it's a lot. We've probably done between six and seven thousand COVID vaccines. And pro I would say a thousand of them were, were actually administered by pharmacists. So that that wow. was a that was a really big step for us is to get our technicians more involved in clinical care, and so in the process they also learned to do testing they also learned to do all those kinds of things. So um, I, I would say again, eighty percent of our COVID testing has been handled by a technician, and and because of the COVID testing, it opened it, it kind of opened our eyes again to the fact that we've got to reengage in these other things. So now. Um, even though we've been able to do it for a long time, now we've started doing strep testing. Uh, we're uh, we're about to start doing UTI testing. Uh, we're doing, of course, flu A and flu B testing, uh, cholesterol checks, uh, and, and these. Right now, we're charging cash for all these services. Um, like you mentioned, you know, we'll do the A one Cs. Um, you know, we'll, we'll even, and this isn't as much as it used to be. Uh, but we even do some of the anti-coag uh, clinic type things. So where folks come in, you know, there are doctors in, in Nashville, which is an hour from us. And so, like, I don't want to drive all the way to the doctor just to get this checked. Right. So they'd rather pay us, you know, 50 bucks or whatever to, to do it. And they don't have to drive to Nashville. So they save money and time and, and all that. So uh, we're just finding that there is definitely a gap in urgent care and as i have grown to love and appreciate the pharmacist role in healthcare, i really realize that having that happen here in our pharmacy is and i don't i don't mean to be disparaging of, of any other segment or industry but having it happen here in our pharmacy I know the level of care they're going to get versus a lot of these urgent care pop-up places, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got these urgent care places that 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 provider's not a member of the community. They've not known this patient for a bazillion years, uh, but they're accessible, right? And so now we have we're accessible and we know the patient, uh, and we have the relationship with their provider and that kind of thing. So. It's um it it's been it's been really good for us and it's it's really invigorated our team and our technicians uh, because we're using technicians to do a lot of it and so they are they're they're super excited because they feel like they're more engaged in the healthcare process versus just you know typing a prescription in yeah well and it's one of those uh, one of those products that you can send a, a prescription out the door and. And you believe that that's going to help that patient and you can help them be adherent um, to that medication to give them the best chance of success with whatever disease state they're they're uh, facing. But it, it seems like taking some of those labs in the pharmacy lets you kind of see that return uh, of, of your care and, and see that, yes, we, we are moving the needle for this patient and, and we're helping them you know, be accountable. We're helping them get their medication and, and be aware of, of what they're doing. Because if, if I'm struggling with, you know, hypertension or cholesterol and I'm seeing my, 
doctor once every six months, there's probably, you know, a week after I see that doctor where I'm going to do everything he said and I'm going to, you know, um, skip the skip the, the, the fried lunch and, and get a salad. <laughs> and then that's going to go down very quickly, right? Uh, because it's going to be six months until, you know, I have that next touch point. Um, whereas a pharmacist, you know, you're able to keep that communication, that, that accountability uh, as the local pharmacy team rather um, and, and, you know, keep that message strong and on, on, on point. Um, you know, I, I think about my dad uh, growing up, you know, watching that roller coaster where he would stress and, you know, he'd go to the doctor and he's like, oh, you know, I'm going to have to, you know, he's going to tell me I can't do all these things anymore. <laughs> and, and, you know, he would, he would change behavior and very quickly change back. And, and, and it was always, uh, I think he could have really benefited from, you know, taking advantage of, uh, uh, you know, a, a more community focused uh, point of accountability. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and to, to your point, too, I know this is about to be a hot topic. I, I know some people are already talking about it, uh, but, uh, you know, we're we're talking a little bit before um, the the PDS conference. I don't know when this will air. But I know at the conference, they're going to talk a lot about remote patient monitoring so and, and chronic care management. And so I know those two things um, are already kind of uh, buzzwords in pharmacy. But I think after that conference and, and that being a huge focus of theirs, I think it's going to really bring to light uh, the possibilities there. Of course, that has to have uh, where right now it, it's fairly simple to uh, you know, get Clea waived and to have a, a pretty generic uh, collaborative practice agreement to do some of these other things. Th this is a little more in, in depth and specific, but I think, you know, we're definitely in that research mode right now of the remote patient monitoring and going, okay, how can we do this to benefit the patient, to benefit the doctors that, that, that serve us and that we serve and, you know, again, benefit the business as well. And I think there's going to be an opportunity there. I think so, too. I, and, and especially if you are already being proactive, if you're already properly documenting your encounters with uh, care goals uh, and, and completing those care actions, you know, for medication synchronization, um, anytime you're doing those uh, uh, lab tests and recording those results, you know, all of those different tools um, – you know, are, are available in your software. Uh, and you can document your time spent. You can document the, the encounter. So many of the uh, care goals that are already in uh, Pioneer Rx have all of the, you know, billable codes, uh, the SNOMED codes, you know, all, all of those uh, pieces that are going to be necessary, you know, as pharmacy moves more towards that Part B uh, slice of the pie. So, um, it is, it is going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing at, uh, at PDS next week, you know, kind of where that focus falls and, and, uh, you know, what, what the, uh, what, what, what the buzzwords are going to come out of PDS with. <laughs> right, right. It, it does. It, it, it kind of, um, it, it sets a tone for the industry a lot of times, uh, or at least creates awareness of things that maybe we weren't all aware of before. Yeah. Yeah, it is it is really interesting how every every trade show season there's a few buzzwords that 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 come out, you know, a couple years ago, um, you know, being a clinical pharmacist started being a buzzword. It's like all all pharmacists are clinical, <laughs> right? Like like it, it's you you're already doing it. You you just need to document um a little bit better. So, uh we're about out of time. Um talked about a lot of cool things that you've done there uh, in your community. What are you excited about uh, in the future? What do you what do you see you guys uh, really focusing on or uh, either doubling down on or introducing to your community? Yeah. So like, I, I guess I got a little ahead of ourselves there talking about the remote patient monitoring. That's something that, that we're excited about. And I love that because it's it's the mixture of technology and uh, you know, and, and healthcare at the same time. So that's a lot of fun for me because I just like to dive into those things. Uh, like, and thinking through the remote patient monitoring thing, we've even talked about uh, and we're excited about creating 
uh, a more of a, a wellness program for our patients to where maybe we utilize some of those same technologies, but offer them on a cash basis to say, okay, well, you know, uh, you're, let's just assume, well, that you are overweight. I know you're in prime physical condition, but let's, <laughs> let, let's assume that you're overweight for a minute. I say, okay, well, uh, we've got this program where you're going to, you're going to get on the scale every day. It's going to report back to us your numbers. You're going to come in and see us once a month. And we're going to have a 15 minute conversation about where you are, what your next focus, your next goals are. Uh, it's going to include, you know, if you if you sign up for a year, it's going to include three cholesterol checks. It's going to include uh, a hormone test and it's going to include this. And, and it's the, you can pay a yearly package for this up front or you can pay a monthly fee throughout whichever you prefer. And you're going to get all those services and we're going to help get you to your health goals. So that's that's something I'm really excited about getting off the ground. Um, in the past, we've had a, a weight loss competition that we did every year uh, where we, we had to, it got so big, we had to rent our local conference center uh, for 10 straight weeks, um, you know, on a given night where we had these big meetings and they were, uh, they were exciting and fun and the community got involved. Uh, but then COVID has kind of killed that. So we've not done it the past two years. And uh, we do it 2021 or now we're not doing it at the beginning of 2022 here. And it's been kind of a sad thing, but it's also given me time to uh, reshape that. And hopefully, hopefully we're creating something with this wellness program that will be a, a longer term solution for people other than just like a 10 week weight loss competition. So, yeah. um, so that's something, that's something we're excited about. Uh, remote patient monitoring uh, growing our sync program without creating another pandemic. I'm excited about, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, our, uh, our, our compounder, um, she has, uh, she's been with us a long time and we sat down, you know, uh, at the end of last year and said, okay, how can we grow this thing? And so we, we created a, an incentive program for her and it's changed her perspective on, uh, helping us grow the the compounding. So we're excited about that. Um, and of course, you, as you know, that's one of the more profitable areas we have. It, it, it's like that gr that great mix of things. It's it's great for the patient. It's great for the business. And, you know, we have an employee that really enjoys doing it. So like it's the, it's oh, the, tri perfect. It, it's yeah. the tri you know, compounding the trifecta. Um, so Anyway, th so those are the things that that we're we're looking for. I'm constantly looking for ways to to improve efficiencies. Uh, so we're working on even little things right now. We're working on um, refilling our robot fewer times throughout the week, right? So we've got a Paradamax two, and uh, you know, as as inexpensive as a lot of the drugs we are that put that, that we put into that robot, you know, we could we could fill it up a little bit more and and refill it a few less times. So just even the little things like that will add up to make a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, man, I, I love the, um, the idea of that patient engagement, uh, those programs, you know, uh, you, you hear it referred to as, you know, a concierge program or as a, uh, as a functional medicine or a functional wellness program. You know, there's so many different ways to go about that. Dr. Kathy Campbell out in Oklahoma, you know, uh, has, has a great program that it's, you know, it's, it's a healthy living. It's a, it's a functional medicine program, but it's marketed in a way that it's like, yeah, that's, I want to go sign up for this weight loss thing, you know? And, uh, I think right now people are just so, um, ready to shake off the, uh, the COVID, um, you know, fast food and eating from home and uh, Grubhub <laughs> and uh, and and also find that sense of community that, man, we've we've all been locked up too long. Let's get out, get healthy and and connect uh, with our community. So great to hear. I think that's going to be crazy successful. Um, let's go ahead and let you get back to work. I'm looking forward to connecting with you out in uh, Nashville here in just a few months. That's right. That's uh, right. So connect is going to be great. You're going to miss Bonnaroo for that, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate you. <laughs> Funny story. I've never actually been to Bonnaroo. That's, it's the thing you have to do. Like, um, 
it's in your it's in your backyard. It's a, it's a big you you have to really turn your neck hard the other way to miss. It. <laughs> you do, you do. But I've, I've never been. I don't know why. It's just it's never it's just never happened. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's music uh, festival people, and then there's not music festival people. I uh, I, I thoroughly like the idea of a music festival, but. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I think I'm with you on that. <laughs> I'm going to watch the highlights. There you go. There you go. Well, I appreciate it. It's been fun. It's been an honor to wear the uh, the headset. And I'm glad that they were uh, that they came um, fully sanitized is what the little note says on there. So, yes, fully sanitized. Lots of lots of great brains in between those uh, those little speakers. So, yeah, ho- hopefully, <laughs> hopefully some of those things from those great brains will go right in my ear into my brains. So hopefully that'll be the case. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon when uh, we have an update on the new uh, McCamey variant. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Until then, uh, thanks for joining us. I'll see you soon, man. All right. Thanks, Will. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond the Scripts, presented by the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please support our channel by liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell so that you'll be notified anytime we post new content. To stay up to date with all of the latest independent pharmacy news and content, follow Pioneer RX on your preferred social media platform. 